today, today, today with presidential candidate Bobby, Bobby Jindal. Jindal. The voice and answers, and answers that you, that need, you to need to hear. To hear. We, start we start there right now. Start there, start there, whatever it is. Right now, you just just read about that. Anyways, it's not Sally's Music and Time Factor Crew, and this is the Sally's Music Time Factor Radio Show, and... Oh boy, I stubbed my laughter. Our composer is all Stu's fault, if you know what I mean. Anyways, for Savory, kick the theme music, shall we? Let's do it! Somebody's gotta say it. That's why all these music and the time factor crew are inside their radio set. That's what Urban Soldier lives here. This is the Yachty Music Time Factor Radio Show. Uh, a real true a real conservative, conservative. A friend, a friend, a friend, a friend of the program. Uh, Bobby, Bobby Jindal joins, joins us now. He's the, the governor of Louisiana. Louisiana. Uh, and somebody and that we hope, hope that you'll take a serious look at it. A serious consideration. He is, as, as I said, said, a true conservative. conservative. Uh, and something, something a tremendous, tremendous story, story. Been been spending um, an hour, an hour or so, so with him, with him on Monday's on, television show, on, uh, and uh, then we'll have some more Monday, of that. On, on uh, Monday's uh, LH Music Company on Westwood One and VH One on uh, Monday morning. Bobby Chen. Uh, you and I, you, we go way back. You're yeah. a long-time friend. I'm a big fan of yours, what you're doing to fight for the conservative cause. For your listeners out at home, I've always done the show remotely, calling in. This is my first time to physically come in your studio since y'all have uh, modernized. And, and, yeah. and this is a beautiful, beautiful space. For the folks that only get to see it on, on the podcast or on TV or hear about it, let me tell you, Glenn's done a great, great job lately. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Nice to have you here. Nice to have you here. First of all. Doing well. Thanks. And you can relate. I know you've got kids. We've talked about our kids before. My oldest, 13-year-old girl. We went to our <clears> first boy-girl dance a couple of weeks ago. I'm completely against this. Uh, I think, <laughs> any dad, I, I think that is enough to convince every father to be for the oh, Second yeah. Amendment. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That it, uh, I offered to send the SWAT team with her. She did not want that. I offered to uh, my wife off the chaperone. She didn't want that either. My my daughter, uh, when yeah. she started dating, uh, I about put the kid into just a coma uh, because I brought my security to sit down and meet him. <laughs> And, uh, and I just told the security, just play along. Sit at the other table. If I look over to you, just look at me, look at your phone, and then just shake your head yes. <laughs> and I had this yeah, kid, this so kid. Proof that I knew all about him. Yeah. Uh, and if you need any tips, if she gets a little older, you call me. That's what yeah, happened. Yeah, I got some good ones. All the fathers, I've got to imagine, dating Glenn Beck's daughter got pretty darn intimidating. Any boy that was brave enough to go through that gauntlet, like, her and oh, his kids were going up. The, the father, the, the next father, day, because next I day actually, was, uh, actually, I ended the conversation, I had a, I put a, a plastic bag in my, in my shoe pocket, and uh, we were just having pizza, and he had a Coke, and he drank the Coke, and at the end of the, the meeting, I... I said, are you done with that? He said, yeah. And I took the plastic bag out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, like my goodness. And, for prints. and he said, oh, my goodness. Are you dusting? I said, I just, you know, just, hey, just no big deal. The father called me the next day. He said, Mr. Beck, and I said, yes. He said, did you dust my son's Coke can for prints? He was pissed. And I, and I was going to say, well, it was well everybody really knows. I said, well, yeah, and he said, you, sir, are a genius. I have, <laughs> I have daughters. I am doing it to them. <laughs> Let's not give away all of our secrets. Yeah, I want our daughters to listen to this thing. Oh, they were bluffing. Oh, oh yeah. They were bluffing. Yeah, they were bluffing. Oh, I have more for you, Bobby. Um, <laughs> okay, so you, no, you've got a family. You've got a family. You know what this you know what is, is, um, is going to be, like. be people like. You know what it's going to you be know like for them. For them. You know that... That, uh, they're going to tear, gonna tear you, apart. you apart. The next president, the next no president who, he is, who he is, is going to face, to the face Abraham, Abraham Lincoln's Lincoln style problem. Style problem. Why, would, Why you would you want this job? That's a great question. And look, I think it's the same reason you continue to speak out. Look, you could easily just say, I'm going to stay at home and be quiet, because you know when you speak out, people come after you. If the next president's going to do what needs to be done, we're going to have to upset a lot of people. We're not talking about incremental change. That's why I've said it's not enough to elect just any Republican. The only reason to do this, folks that are running because they want fame or they want glory, they're misguided. The only reason to do this, the idea of America is slipping away from 
Now, look, every politician will tell you this election is the most important one. This one's really good. If we don't change direction dramatically, I don't mean gradually or incrementally, I think we're done. So tell me the most dramatic thing that you think. Because this is, we were talking about this yesterday. We were talking about this yesterday. I want tax plans. I want tax plans today. We're shutting down the IRS in a completely different way. I want to hear. I want to hear. Big Silicon Valley type thinking. Really bold Really bolder ideas. Because that's what would have to be the mission. And quite honestly, that's only thing that's going to heal. So tell me. Well, tell me. Give me something. Give me some Bobby Jindal. Give me some Bobby Jindal. Listen, we start with tax plans. Domestically, we have got to shrink the size of the federal government. Not just. Lowest growth rate. I'm the only candidate that's done that. We cut our state budget 26 percent, 30,000 fewer state bureaucrats. All these other candidates talk about shrinking government. They've never done it. So my tax. Every Republican's got a tax plan, a lower rate, and we've got that. You know, 25 percent, 10 percent, 2 percent. Three things that are different, radically different about my tax. So a bunch of these Republicans say we want. You know, Trump and Jeb have said we're going to have half of Americans pay no income. I think that's crazy. I think everybody should pay something. Yes. And so our plan's got a 2% rate. It's not about how much money we raise, but it's the most important 2%. We're all in this together. If we want government to stop wasting money, we got to care about it. It's got to be our money. It's too easy to think, well, that money grows on trees if we're not paying something. So, so we make a 2% rate up to what? So up to $10,000 for a single filer, $20,000 for a married filer. The next uh, level is $90,000 for a single, $180,000 for a married uh, uh, when you get up to 10%. So a middle-class family, teacher, you know, police officer, married today, making 150. They're paying 25% today. They pay 10% under my plan. But it does two other things that are pretty dramatic. Number one, uh, number two, it also it eliminates the corporate tax. Not reduces it, just gets rid of it. Oh, these guys oh, play yeah. games. They hire oh, accountants yeah. and lobbyists. They don't pay these taxes. Make the CEO pay. And we get rid of a whole bunch of the deductions and all the loopholes. And we preserve five. But we get rid of all the other nonsense they put in the tax code. Here's the thing where the left, they're going to attack me on this, but I'm actually proud of it. We shrink how much money. We dramatically do, we cut 22% of the revenue going to the federal government over the next 10 years. Now, the left's going to hate it. They're going to say, I want to Well, if we don't do that, we're done. If we elect a Republican president, and before we've had Republican majorities, Republican presidents, they slow the growth rate, nothing changes. We get $18 trillion of debt. We're drowning in debt. Now, this tax plan, it grows the economy, all kinds of numbers. 14% GDP growth, 6 million jobs, you know, 9%, uh, over 8 to 9% uh, wage growth. But here's the fundamental thing. Here's the most important thing we've got to do domestically. And then one other thing, uh, domestic. This president has done a great job changing the American dream to be all about the government taking care of us. That's what he's tried to do. We're in the path towards socialism. And we, let's just be honest about it. I mean, Bernie Sanders calls himself a socialist. Hillary's no better, and, and Obama's no better, and there are a bunch of Republicans on a whole lot of They want to be you know, Obamacare light. They want to be, look, if this election is about who can give away the most stuff to the government, we're done. We never win that fight. It's not a fight worth having. We've got to look at the American people and be honest with them and say what makes America great is not the government gives you stuff. It's that you got freedom in this we got to fight to get that freedom back. Shrinking the government is not just about growing the economy. It's getting our freedom back, but secondly, internationally. This country better be serious about, and I know you've written about this, I know you feel strongly about this as well. We better be serious about the threat of radical Islamic terrorism. So tell me about it. So tell me about it. Tell me about it. Tell me about Tell me about Islam. The reality is, is Islam's got a problem. And, and, you know, I, I know nobody on this stage is politically correct, but let's just, you know, let's go ahead and be honest. And I know we're going to get a bunch of folks saying, oh, you're anti Muslim, or you're racist, that's not. This is just on. This is true. Islam's got a problem, and that's radical. And what we need our president to say to Muslim clerics and leaders, they've got to do two things. At least one, they've got to explicitly say, they've got to condemn by name these individual, by these terrorists, these murderers. Let's call them what they are. They can't just, you can't just condemn a generic act of violence. You can't say, oh, well, we're against. You, know, you have to say, no, these individuals are not martyrs. They're not going to enjoy a reward in the afterlife. They're going straight to hell where they belong. And then, second, they have to explicitly say, we fully embrace religious liberty and all the freedoms for people of different religious beliefs that we want for ourselves. It can't be that we want freedoms for us, but we don't want other people to have those same freedoms. When it comes to ISIS, when it comes to Islam, you've got a president, we've got a president, who went to the Pentagon a few weeks ago and said, this is a generational conflict, we've got to change hearts and minds. But they are burning people alive, raping, crucifying, torturing, killing Christians, other uh, uh, Muslims, other religious minorities. You want to negotiate with them? 
We're going to hunt them down and kill them. He calls Fort Hood an incidence of workplace violence. If we won't name, acknowledge, the enemy Secretary Kerry wants to allow many more Syrian refugees in our country. We know ISIS wants to send terrorists. We know they want mm -hmm. to send terrorists into Europe and in America. Why are we letting them in? They don't even have to sneak in. If we're going to let them in the front door, why would we do that? Well, we're, we're accepting fifteen dollars per year, and they're all being paid. I mean, I don't know. That's that's the same. That's the same to me. But how do we? Um, you know, we've just raised. Just got a note uh, this morning. We have broken the ten million dollar mark uh, in what is it? That six weeks? All yeah. coming in in hundred dollar checks. Uh, trying to raise money to save the Christians in the Middle East, the Nazarene Fund. Ten million dollars. So that tells me at least this audience um, uh, is very well aware of what's going on. That we are now facing the St. Louis, the ship that we turned away in in the 1930s. Uh, that we're facing the same thing the world faced before, an extermination of a race of people based on their religion. Um, and I get a lot of heat from uh, people, even people, in this even audience, audience, saying, saying you, can't you can't bring, bring any, any of them through here. here. My answer to my that answer is, they are betting far superior to the United States. States, 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 States. The second of all, second um, all how many members how many of, members ISIS, of ISIS, ISIS are Christians? Zero. Zero. How do you deal, How do you deal with, with the, the crisis of not the war refugees? If your Muslim friends in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has got lots, 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 lots of room. Jordan has lots of room. They can, they can know the difference between, 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 between the bad guys and the good guys. The West, the West will diminish. So, they, so can do they can do that. How do you deal, how do you deal with the Christians, the Christians and, and this? this Open door, open door in Europe. In Europe. It's going to crush you. Well, you're exactly right. What I worry about is those folks born in Europe have a much easier time than coming to the United States yeah. where they can do us harm. Look, we get, the vetting is so important, and I applaud the generosity of your audience. Let's get to the root cause of this. Because this administration wants to talk Band-Aid. This just didn't happen by accident. You've got millions of refugees there because this president's failed foreign policy. Let's, think, let's just for a moment step back and think about what we're seeing today. So you've got Assad and Putin and Iran and Hezbollah working together. I mean, can you imagine this all happened because this president, he created a void. He said there would be a red line. He said if Assad crossed that red line, if he used chemical weapons, he goes, there are going to be consequences. It has been his official policy that Assad has got to go, but he's done nothing to accomplish that. He has said his official policy is we're going to hunt down and kill ISIS. He's done not enough to accomplish that. So we're going to take the handcuffs off the military. You've had General Petraeus come to the Congress and offer ideas. You've had other uh, military, current and former military leaders saying what we should be doing. Why aren't we arming and training the Kurds directly? Amen. Yes. Thank you. The Kurds have been the effective force on the ground. Thank you. Turkey yes. is willing to help us to go in, and other Sunni allies are willing to go after ISIS. Mm -hmm. What they don't want to do is to go after ISIS if it leaves Assad in power. What they don't want to do is prop up Iran and Shia power. They're not convinced America is in this window. So now we're in a position where our friends don't trust us, our enemies don't fear and respect us. Look, Putin went into the Ukraine and Crimea because he didn't respect the White House. Nothing, nothing of consequence happened to him, so now he's going into Syria. China is testing us in the South China Sea. Let's be, let's be clear about what's going on. These are big, mm. big adversaries. They respect the Turks. They don't want a, a conflict with the United States. But if they feel like there's no strong pushback, they're going to keep doing this. More with Bobby Jindal. Well, Bobby Jindal, just, just a second. second. Chris, 